Okay. No problem, no problem. Good afternoon, everyone. And this is Ben. And so like what uh, Luis said, some of you might and already know me, or I have the opportunity to work with you already before. I just want to reiterate that uh, what I'm about to share is solely my opinion and my experience in a library setting and what I would do in any situations. And uh, I've also spent uh, some time with the Lake County Sheriff's Department in Corrections. Uh, let me uh, clarify that, not as an inmate, but uh, as a corrections officer. And uh, sometimes I'm asked about that. And uh, several years as a uh, reserve deputy. And uh, as uh, Louis said, I was a, a Vietnam era veteran. Seems like a long time ago. When I was working in the library, I was given whatever tools I needed to learn and implement library policies regarding security and safety issues. I was really very happy because my director was very, very safety conscious. And with that, I put together a library response guide for incidents and assisted in putting together a disaster recovery plan. As you probably remember, a couple of weeks or a couple of weeks or three weeks ago, a terrible tragedy happened in New Mexico that I would assume sent shockwaves in the library community. Two colleagues of ours were slain by a teenager and four was hurt. Just want to say our thoughts and prayers to our colleagues who passed and to their families and hoping for a quick recovery for the others who got hurt. As we all know, we live in a deeper world, an ever increasing risk nowadays. No workplace, and no office space or no construction site, no factory floor or riddle space is immune from any of these threats. And with these threats comes safety issues, employee morale, and it affects your, our company's goals, our library goals. There are different intentional threats, sabotage or violence, or by natural disasters or man-made accidents. But no matter the threat, each and every employee have a responsibility to help your workplace protect your employees, data information, and in the case of libraries, patrons, and its facilities. Of course, we do not have to do a round every time we call threatened, but you see, more often than not, employees are the main targets of these threats, simply because, as I said, in a library setting, you are the first person at the range individual may see upon entering, or the first person who had a very rough day to speak with. As an employee, each and every one of you is an integral part of your security. Security solution from the sorting room to the boardroom. Security, in my opinion, is a shared responsibility. Simply put, security begins with all of you, all of us, each individual. I don't know if you would remember, but uh, a while ago, we have people that were called monitors. Uh, I started when we're still using index, index cards. I'm sure you remember that. And what were their descriptions before? Well, they can vary from greeting patrons, helping circulation, checkouts, shelving, basically a general all around person. But with changes in the library, such uh, as library getting bigger, more programs, new technologies, and such to say the economy, it brings, you know, with this with these new things brings issues. And uh, with the issues comes new patrons. 
I have to introduce you. For people who have already been working in the library, you probably have your own, your own characterizations of what kind of patrons you deal with. As I said, this is what I dealt with. And I just want to reintroduce them to you or introduce them to you as I saw them before. Because knowing your patrons goes a long way in dealing with problems that may arise. Not because you know them personally, but you know their type, their profile, if you may. And the outcome of the transition comes these patrons. Let's start with the regulars. I'm sure you know these regulars. They are the senior citizens that comes in in the morning. Nine o'clock, Kate opens, they come in. We would think to ourselves, no, we won't have it any problems with seniors. They just come in for newspapers. They drink their coffee, uh, for those who are uh, allowed to bring in their coffee. And uh, they do have their own seats also. But mind you, they do argue. They do have problems. We do get problems from them. Now, not problems, but issues. They have to have the newspaper that they often use all the time in the morning. If it's the new sun, they have to have that new sun. Oh, if somebody gets that in the morning, yeah, a problem arises, they come to security or they come to somebody, circulation or reference or you to say, hey, somebody get my newspaper. I need that. I want that. It's funny in a way, but that is one of our patrons and that is our regular patrons in the morning. We don't want to alienate them. So we just talk to them. Dealing with them, I just talk and then I say, okay, the next time we'll make sure you get the paper, but we cannot really promise it. So actually, I don't say that you'll get it the next day. If it's there, it's there. And uh, then I will talk to the other person and say, maybe, maybe you can use another paper in the morning just to satisfy everybody. And normally it works that way. And those are our seniors. Then we have the program, the program people. Let's start with the program moms. Uh, normally we don't have any problem with the program moms or issues at all, except maybe, maybe when they, well, they always have their children with them. Of course, especially during story time. And I'm sure you're, you know this happens. After story time, noise comes in because they're about to check out their books and they come to circulation. And when the kids are sick, they just kind of let them drool all over the counter in the circulation desk. It does happen a lot. And all you can do is smile and wipe afterwards. But um, with the moms, most often than not, they don't really say anything to the kids, the three or four year olds that run around. And that, and that is the issue with the program moms. How to deal with them? Basically, we just let it go. I just let it go. Uh, simply because uh, they check in, they check out, and that's it. Now with the dads, that's a different. The program dads, nowadays we have a lot of them. For some reason, they do not tell their children to be quiet when they're running around or say anything. Um, I think they just don't want to be seen as very strict or too strict or not a good father. But uh, to deal with them too, as I said, they come in and they come. But if it really, if you really need to, they also listen. The, the, the fathers listen right away. They won't look at you in the eye, but they will listen and say, okay, they will take care of the kids and get them from uh, running around. My favorite is the grandparents. Oh, they don't put up with anything. Yeah, when they get there and the kids are bad, oh, not bad, but they're running around or noisy or whatever, grandparents are there right away. They're at their tail. Don't get them to sit down. And the kids, yep, they listen. So uh, those are our program people. 
the job seekers. We go to the job seekers. With more computers that we have in the library, the more people we help in applying for jobs. Most of the time, they are there for, some libraries allow them to be there for X amount of time only, and some a little X amount of time. That's when problems arise. Um, example, you have a library that would only allow two hours a day. And after that, that's, that's it. You have to talk to them, the reference people will have to remind them that's all they can get, two hours a day. And they will grumble, and especially if they are really in a dire situation looking for a job, hey, and they will get out of that chair and look around, and there are a lot of spaces. Now, these are library policies. We don't want to mess with library policies. What I'm trying to say is that job seekers, their, their patients are thin. They are like uh, you touch them and they jump, um, especially the ones who've been looking for jobs for X amount of months or even years. They will start an argument. Now, how to handle them? You have to explain. I explain that that is policy. That is the only way we can get them in. We will give them other alternatives. We'll give them uh, the, the next, the address of the next library. Anything to appease them. Not anything, but something to appease them. Another thing to to think about is that when you are talking to someone, what I do is I take them on the side. That way they're not talking with anybody listening. Uh, nobody's listening to you and him or her. And uh, it lessens, it lessens uh, their anxiety. So they tend to listen more. That's what I do. Students, students come in regularly. They come in after school, they come in before school, they come in uh, for reviews, research. Most of the time they're okay. But let me touch on this subject. A lot of times too, after hours, students come in, in couples. I have to bring this up because in my experience, it happened quite a few times or it, hap it still happens nowadays. Um, they look for a place to be intimate. And uh, I'm trying to be very careful in uh, how I say it, but I have caught a lot of couples, students before, in uh, situations where they shouldn't be. And believe it or not, libraries have a lot of nooks and crannies a lot of empty rooms and for some reason or another and they're bent on looking for a place they do find it sometimes they even do it outside now how to deal with it if i catch them and they're minors i will do everything in my power at that time to get the parents involved now i have not really handled anybody over 18 at the time that I caught or that we caught. So it's mostly minors, 14, 15 years old, 16 years old. It does happen in the library. As a matter of fact, I'll just have to uh, go to a town a tangent here. Um, Harvard University, they did this study of 2013, a graduating class of 2013. The only study they did from what I understand, 13% of that graduating class had sex in the library. I just have to throw that in there. Now, those are your students. Most of the time, they will listen to you. I give them time when they come in. Of course, they'll be noisy. They'll be walking around, doing something. But... Uh, After about five minutes or 10 minutes, they will settle down.
I always give them time to settle down. You just can't jump on the students right away when they're doing, running around or doing something. They have to settle down after class. They have that pent up energy. You have to let it go a little bit. A lot of libraries now uh, can handle the noise. Uh, the way we're built, the way the building is built, you can have an ordinary conversation as long as you're not screaming. You are allowed to do that now. Not like before, you have to be hush hush all the time. Those are my students. And then we have the hangers on. This can be anybody. This can be anybody that comes in the library either for because it's hot or it's cold. Uh, it can be a, a, a teenager, a younger person or whatever. But this can also be social engineered people. They can talk to you because they don't have anything else to do. They will talk to you and pry information from you that you don't even know you're giving out. They're very good social engineers. We have quite a few of them where I came from. They'll be talking to you and the next thing you know, uh, he or she knows the birthday of your director, where they went in a vacation, where a certain person is going, who retired, who's resigning, who got accepted in a position. They are the good social engineers. They're just hanging, they're just hangers on. How you deal with them? Well, you talk. I talk to the staff and just ask them to be careful at what information we give out. First of all, it's private privacy issues. And um, to what's up for certain, certain giveaways for people asking questions about something, some person, or even dates. Because they can ask you example. I'll give you an example. Um, I'll pick out a date. September 11 is uh, so and so's birthday, isn't it? And as a staff member, you don't know what this person has asked you. No, 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 no. It's not that day. And out of the blue, you, you mentioned. Hi, Ben. I think we lost your sound. Are you still there? I'm sorry, everyone. I think Ben lost his sound. Can you hear me okay? Okay. So you can hear me, but not Ben. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh, gotcha. You're back. <laughs> I'm back? Okay. I don't know what You're happened back. there. I don't know I what don't happened. Know where, was, where was I? What was the last thing you heard from me? Um, was I with the that. students? Or did you lose me a long time ago? Oh, the birthday. The story about somebody's birthday. Yes. Okay. So you just I'm lost me for a few minutes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You just lost me for a few, uh, maybe a minute there, not even a minute. Okay, as I was saying, uh, be careful with the social engineers. They can get a lot of information from you through the back door without you knowing it. And uh, as I said before, what I do with this situation is talk to staff members and be careful of what kind or, uh, of information they give out. And 99% uh, of the time, yes, they do watch out for this and we do watch out for it. Our next patron in line is the out of service area patrons. Uh, of course, if you are, let's say, uh, Gurney, Gurney has, has policies different than other libraries. And if uh, somebody from Waukegan goes to Gurney and uh, they're not getting the same, some of the, uh, should I say, uh, benefits of being a Gurney patron, they can argue. They start arguing. and. Most of the time, I am not, or I do not get involved in this. I just listen, make sure nothing happens with it. But they do get very aggressive sometimes because they think that, well, Keegan is so close to Gurney, why can't I have that? Our cards are accepted all over Lake County. Why can't I have that? Or over Illinois, why can't I have this? 
Now, all you can do is explain the policy as a staff member, explain the policy of your library. And as a security officer or, uh, within the area, just watch out for any voice raising uh, or, or more aggressiveness than a normal way. What I mean by that is uh, people will get upset. They will get mad. And uh, you let them vent, you let them say what they want, and most of the time it will gradually go down and they will adhere to what your policy is. Drunks, ha. Huh? Most of the time when we get drunks, we know they're drunk or they're, uh, I would say, impaired somehow by uh, something, either alcohol or drugs. Drugs, we don't know, we cannot assume that, but uh, with alcohol, we can smell the alcohol. And if they're, they're, they may not be bothering anybody, but in my opinion, my way of handling them is always involving the police. I call non-emergency line. There is a person who is inebriated, who could hardly stand up, keeps falling on and off the chair, and basically it's an unwanted subject. Um, they will come, they'll ask you who it is, they'll, you'll go with them, point them out, and most of the time they can get the person out. All of the time they can get the person out. But there are times when um, there are people who you don't know what they're on in. What I mean is you don't know what their kind of drugs, if they have drugs in their body, they will fight. They will fight the police. They'll be noisy. They'll be screaming. It happens. It happened in my experience several times. And it can get scary when you have four, five, six police officers trying to pin a down, man down and making sure he doesn't hurt himself. And all you can hear is a screaming and the library patrons are all worried about that and all what's going on. Uh, it just isolate, isolate the incident as much as possible as a staff member and as a security officer. Isolate the area so that the other patrons won't get too scared or too worried about it. And um, that rarely happens, but when it happens, it's one of those uh, when your adrenaline starts pumping up because you don't know where it's going to go. Those are the drugs. And then we have the physically and the mentally challenged patrons. Um, I hope I said it right. I'm trying to be politically correct. But there are situations where you would have, not situations, but there are days when you will have van loads of uh, students coming in from um, schools for challenge people. One encounter you will have sometimes is uh, when they get aggravated and it happens, and it happened in the library where I was before, again, and how I dealt with it. They started stripping, taking their clothes off, everything. This is a female, until she's totally devoid of clothing in the middle of the hallway. All you can do is run and get something to cover them with, to cover her with, and um, hopefully the other staff members which I did at that time help me surround surround her and put some blanket on her. How do you handle physically challenged people? Very carefully. There are people who are challenged who you think would not, is very normal in every kind of sense. You have to be careful because they really, some of them are really not. Um, they will ask for rooms. Sometimes a couple who are challenged, uh, slow, if you may, would ask for a room 
I mean nonchalantly as per room. And in your mind, you already know what they want the room for. And you have to explain to them that it's not for that purpose. It's not right. Um, you just talk to them normally. They will talk back to you normally too. And that's why I said, be careful on how you deal with each and every one of the physically and mentally challenged people. Um, Got to do it very carefully. You, you help them very carefully also because uh, you don't know how to handle them physically if they needed help. Uh, most of the time they have the caregivers with them, but if the caregivers are not there right next to them at that particular time and they needed help, you have to do something. You just have to be very careful. Um, this is one of my favorite ones, the do-gooders. They will come to you. And these are, these are people you just know by face most of the time, regulars in the library. The do-gooders will come to you and ask for, not ask, but tell you that somebody might be writing on a book close to the reference books or close to the audiovisual. Somebody's hiding something. Somebody's trying to steal something. These are the do-gooders, I call them, because every time they come up, they show up, they have something to report. And believe it or not, 50% of the time, half of the time, what they're pointing out is true, but not necessarily in the context of doing something bad. They may be putting it in a bag, they're not out to steal it. They're putting it in a bag because excuse me, because they want to go out to circulation and check it out. It's just that too, it's awkward to carry the books individually, so put it in a bag and not to, not to steal them. So that's one of the do-gooders, um, what they want to do. They like to be appreciated. And I do thank them for being extra vigilant around the library because you can never can tell when the report would really be bad and they're not really doing anything bad. They're just you know, sharing the information they see that in their perceptions at that time is bad. How about these are also under the two gooders, especially on the front desk. Reference people, circulation people, I mean, staff, um, youth department. Ever had anybody approach you and say, oh boy, you need something to do. Oh man, I'd like your job. You sit in there, here's something for you to do. And they don't even realize that before they came along, you are in circulation, you're taking care of a line that's for an hour with 10, 20 books that they want to check out. What the staff do with it? Well, sad to say, most of our staff members just take the abuse. They don't mean bad, but in my opinion, it's it's a backdoor abuse, but you can't do anything about it. You know what you want to say, but to be politically correct, and because you want your job, you're not going to say it. You just smile. That's what you do. You'll smile. They're not hurting anybody. They just want your job because you're not doing anything. They don't realize what you've done before. You are just in a lull. Well, how about the friendly patrons, the, one, the ones who would tell you everything that happens in their life, the TMI friendly people, the TMI patrons, they will confess everything to you, things you don't even want to know, things that they should realize 
90% of the time that they say something or their problems to other people, 90% of the time that those people listening don't even care. And 10% of the time, people are listening are thankful that it's happening to them, to the other person, not to them. So, uh, but these, these are, they just want to talk to somebody. They want to tell you they just got a divorce. They want to tell you, uh, oh, somebody's talking to me and maybe true or not, or somebody just passed away. Information that you don't really need. Most of the time I handle it is as I just walk. I just get up, tell them, excuse me, I have to make my rounds, or excuse me, I have to do something else. The staff, sometimes they are stuck. They're sitting there, they cannot do what I just did to, to get up and go. What you can do is just tell them straight to the point. I really don't want to listen or I don't have time to listen because of my work. Now, because of what you will say, if you are clear-minded, telling them exactly what you feel, that patron will never be good to you anymore. You just shun them. But that's how it happens. That's how it's expected. You have to do something. You cannot, you cannot let them tell you too many things because uh, they'll hang around. And every time they see you, oh my God, you just even avoid looking at them or eye contact and pretend you don't see them, but they're still they're focused on you because they can tell you their story. They'll home in on you. They will come to you. They will wait. They will wait for the next clerk, which would be you, to check out the books so they can talk to you and tell you their story, which you don't want to hear. So it's better to tell them straight to the point you can listen. You have the job you have to pay attention to. And if they get upset and not make you the best friend anymore, so much the better. They will come back. They will come back because they want the library. They want the contact. They'll do it to somebody else. Well, they will try. Those are the friendly people. Now, Here's another one that I'm sure you don't want to see or to have experience with. These are the entitled patrons. Why can't I do this? Why can't I put this book on reservation because I am from Waukegan and I'm not from Gurney? I know the director. I can talk to him, I'll call him right now. I pay my taxes, I pay your salary, oh boy. Again, you want to tell them what you really have in your mind? Not good. Um, you love your job. You want to be politically correct. And uh, it'll pass. You let them vent. Security-wise, we just have to listen again and make sure it doesn't get too aggressive. For the staff member again, you listen, let them vent and explain the policy. That is what you should do. And that's what it's done. That's what I tell staff members. And uh, that's what their supervisors or managers tell them to do. Policies are policies. We have to live with it. How about the last minute patrons? Once you check out in the last second, almost, you know, you got uh, 15 minutes prior to closing is announced, five minutes is announced, two minutes time, here they come with 20 books. Most of the time, you know why they do that. We all know why they do that. They try to avoid paying late fees. That's basically, they have problems with their cards. And uh, unfortunately, because it's time to close, yes, they get to hear the words, take care of it the next time you come in. Unfortunately, that happens. But 
most of the time they they do get stuck too. I see them leave 20 books behind, they cannot pay their fines. The last minute checkout did not work. They hate everyone patrons. Those are the ones who start talking to you and hate everyone. They don't like people coming from other countries. They don't like people getting social security. They'll tell you everything. They tell you what they like and they do this loudly. And I always jump in and say, you want to say that you want to do that, please do it outside. You want to check out your books, please check out your books and you're free to leave the building. It's always good you know, to, to let them know right away that it's not welcome in the library. Doesn't matter whether it was security or staff member, they start spewing things like that. I've been called so many names. I've been cursed. I mean, that's part of the job. I know we don't get paid enough to take any insults or abuse or anything like that, but uh, sticks and stones. So uh, let it go out over our heads. Then we have the wannabe gangbangers who come in. They're not really gangbangers. They come in groups, give signs that you don't know whether gang signs or not. If they're not doing anything wrong, they're not being noisy. They're not being not taking away anybody's time away from the desk or anything like that. They're not rummaging to anything not being loud, leave them be. That's what I do. And how you approach them is always good. If they're doing something wrong, I do it in a very friendly way. There is only one time that I accosted three people because they're giving other patrons a hard time in the computers that they challenged me. They challenged me in a way that, believe it or not, one of our security persons who just started that day walked out right away and got scared. They were really saying they were part of this gang and whatnot. And I'm glad somebody was there to back me up. I, I backed out. I only tried to approach them because they're giving somebody a hard time. If not, I wouldn't have. But that taught me a lesson also. If you don't think you can handle it, don't call for police. Police are always there. And that's what I've been doing every time. Hey, you're bigger than me and I think you can kick my butt and you're belligerent. I'm not going to mess around. I call the police first. Say, okay, I wanted to talk to somebody. I know they're going to be belligerent. I do it. I do it simply because it's there, it's available, they can help. And then we say it to the homeless people. The homeless people who would like to uh, use your washrooms as their bathrooms. Of course, policy can't allow that. They can stay in the library. You can talk to them and stay in the library as long as they, you know, they adhere to any policies that, you know, from the library. Um, if they also smell bad and you don't have a policy about that, I would suggest that you talk to your managers because sometimes they do come in and, and other people, other patrons are the ones complaining. Now, if you have a policy against that, then you can ask them to leave or wash up gently and most of the time they just want a seat to sit on a warm place or a cold place we leave them be we have flashers this happens usually at night it is hard to catch you will get reports Sometimes they will, you know, not sometimes, but they will come to security and say, somebody just flashed me 
or somebody was doing something in the nook over there and showing me what that. You try to get into the camera and see what you can get from the camera. If you can get from the camera the incident itself, go ahead and um, make sure it's take. What I mean is uh, segregate, separate that that part of the tape. And uh, police work again. You call the police. You already got the picture of the perpetrator, and give it to the police. Let the police handle it. Porn users. We have a subcategory for porn users. You have the browsers, the gigglers. The gigglers are the ones who are looking at pop-ups. For some reason, they get pop-ups. The browsers, and that's part of the hangers on, they don't have anything else to do. The bingers, those are the ones who only, only do. The whole time in there in the library, whether they're in their laptops or in their uh, in the public computer, is what's porn. Yes, we can tell them that other patrons do not like what they see. We have a policy against that. Uh, even if we have full access in the library, if a patron complains, then yes, we can tell them to get out of that site. That is if your policy says so. Um, most of the time, a lot of libraries are full access now except for the youth department. Um, well, it's better to visit that and see if you have a policy on this because um, you also want to protect other patrons. And then we have the interactive users. It speaks for itself. We do get them, we do catch them, and they do get banned or suspended per year. I don't know if you do that in your own libraries, but we do have the capability of banning or suspending a, a patron for doing major incident. Um, so we call the police. The police will ask, do you want to charge them? No, we just want them out of the library for a year because that's the maximum we can do at the library where I came from. At the same time, since we cannot charge them other things, the police will charge them for indecency or whatever they want to tack on there. Those are for the interactive users. Believe me, there are a lot of them out there too. Uh, do we have, by the way, uh, these are only some of the characterizations I gave to, uh, or I have learned from the time I was in the library. It, it helped me in my capacity as a security manager, because not just that, but as a security person or as a staff member, because I can put them in some category. If something happened, I already know, oh, this is how it looks like, or that's the person, or this is what happens. Then I can isolate that category, and it reminds me right away. It's a nice power up to add to your power of observation. You have them segmented. And then you can just put them in one of them and remember everything. Not everything, but a lot of things. That's how I do it. That's how I did it. Of course, you'll do something different, but if you can pick something that you can use, do it. Uh, as long as you adhere with the policy of your library. Do we have any questions, Louise, or comments? Um, not so far. So I'll just make a quick announcement you know if you do have questions for Ben you know go ahead and type those into your questions box and we'll try to address as many as possible I am just going going to go through some of the minor and the major incidents that we have to tackle and uh, I know we are pressed for time so I'm not gonna I am not gonna go through uh, it's one explaining it's one. Uh, I'll just go through it one by one. And uh, if you have any questions or comments at that time, just go ahead and uh, type it in. Because in case of minor disruptions, in my, where I, what we did is that we give two warnings and at the third offense that we have to approach the patron, we ask them to leave the building. 
examples of minor disruptions. We have the eating or drinking if they're not allowed in your library. They're only allowed certain sections like a food vending or cafeteria or whatnot. It's sleeping, some libraries do not allow this only because if they snore loud, okay, uh, you just be gently, gently just wake them up and say you're snoring. Harassing others, verbally or through actions, kids do this a lot. Teenagers do this a lot. You just warn them, just talk to them, they'll listen to you. Um, but sometimes, uh, you know, with, with teens and with teens in high school, it's like being a cemetery a caretaker. They're under you, but nobody listens. Oh, I know that's a bad analogy. I'm sorry. Uh, smoking. Of course, smoking is not allowed inside the buildings anymore bringing any animals except for uh, for service animals. We also, in my library, we are not allowed, I'm sure you are, you are to not allowed to ask someone whether their animals are service animals. Um, ADA uh, actually forbids us to do that. And uh, Nowadays, though, you can buy, you can, I, I mention this because you can buy any service animal jackets online. So you really couldn't tell, but if it's not, you know, it's a small animal, it's not running around or anything like that. So even if it's a big animal, well, what I do is I always go to the back door and say, that's a good, that's a beautiful service animal you have there. Even if it's as big as a pony. Now, just to let the, just so I can hear the answer, yes, he or she helps me when I'm walking around. I already know that it's a service animal. Now, um, but that's, I try to do it in a nice way. Excessive noises, use of mobile phones, pagers. Well, we don't use pagers anymore. Uh, or uh, selling or profit outside or inside the library. These are minor offenses. And we tell them to stop. They can't do that against policy. Uh, distributing leaflets against policy, again. Of course, you can use skateboards or wheeled footwear inside the library, rollerblades, except for strollers. Of course, uh, we can use the strollers. These are some of, some of the minor ones. Um, I always give a warning whenever a minor disruption comes up. I just am not one of those people and we shouldn't be so strict. You know, we have to maintain our customer side always in a library, security, and customer service should go hand in hand. We should be able to tell them somebody who's not doing something right against our policy that it's not right. And if they have to be sent home and you said it and did it properly, they will smile at you and say thank you and they'll be back the next day. Yeah, good customer service is always there. It had to be there. It has to be there as part of security. And I know the staff members are already doing this a lot. Extreme disruptions. Now, uh, uh, for some reason, you know, I, there, I, I use the no shirt, no shoes on an extreme one because they can come in, most of the time people will come in with no shoes, no shirts, are up to no good. They'll be loud right away coming in. So I have to ex escort them out right away. Now, most of the time, these are the ones that are wannabe gangbangers. Uh, wearing hats or any headgear, it's just a way to signify or represent a gang affiliations. Flashing gang hand signs. 
we don't really know if they're gang hand signs, but they are, I put them in this extreme disruption because as soon as they do that, patrons get nervous, staff member gets nervous, I get nervous. So I deal with it right away. If there's several of them, I go to my backup, I call the police. They're always good, they always help you. You know, with, with theft, there's two kinds of theft in a library, theft from a library property, which we try to maintain the lowest, lowest level. I'm sure we have books that are being taken out, DVDs, CDs, but a lot of times we really cannot see. We, we, there is no way unless we check its bike as they go out. The theft of property goes to the police right away. We take the report. We write it down in the incident report. And the police gets notified. If it's a bicycle, most of the time it's a bicycle. Computer, I should say, smartphones, computers not too much, smartphones. Those are the ones that we check. We check the videos right away. And uh, we see if it's, it's in the playback. Most of the time, the bicycles that get lost, like like one one person, one teenager who stole a bike. Yeah, I caught them, uh, I caught the scene in the computer, I mean in the, camera and uh, the next day he came back and said, why didn't you take the bike? You took the bike and I accosted him and, and the kid said, I just didn't have a ride. So he took a bike. It's just one incident that for me it's funny, but it does happen. A lot of these stolen bikes are taken because it's available either to go home or to go someplace else. The phones, the phones are normally taken because they are left on a desk on the chair by the computer. It's a crime of opportunity. As I said, it's a police matter. Fighting, fighting is number one. Fighting you have to stay away from. If a fight occurs, do not touch anyone, especially if they're adults. They come to fisticuffs. You remember what they're wearing, you remember who they are. If you want to be verbal, start screaming. If you want to, while well, somebody's calling 911, somebody should be calling 911 while you're telling them to stop. That's all you can do, stop, stop, stop fighting, stop. Now, most of the time, if they're teenagers, they will listen to you and they will stop. But just don't hold them or touch them because you will get in the middle and you probably can get hurt. If they're fighting, you don't want to try to catch them when they run outside. That's why I said, take the information that you can get, what they're wearing, names from the people next to them, or what I mean, their friends. And uh, that's how I handle it. I just 911, scream at them. Believe it or not, in the corrections department, whenever there's a fight in the cell or inside the pod, all we can do is scream until the backup arrives. You don't want to get in the middle. And that same, uh, that goes true for being outside too. You never know. You never know. Of course, somebody, this another one is a major one, somebody trying to bribe an employee. Hey, uh, this happened twice from my experience. Somebody trying to bribe an employee $20 to get out of a $60 fine. I thought that was funny. I thought he was kidding. He wasn't kidding. That's a major. And most of the major incidents carry a year suspension from my experience. Oh, um, Public indecency, of course, is part of that. Uh, being caught in sexual nature is part of that. Part of the major disruption. A patron can be disrupted as soon as they come in the door and you see them, whenever you see them come in and they're already disrupted and they're, 
belligerent some way or another, do not hesitate to call the police right away. Because it's hard to talk down a situation when the person is already belligerent. You ask them, uh, especially if somebody tells you, we have an international in our community, and I mean, international staff in our library when, when I was there. Hearing some, some person say, you have to go back where you belong. You don't belong here. It's hard to listen to. Now, those are the things that you hear from people who are, who are there just to disrupt, just because they want to get, those are the, one of the entitled people too. They will go to that extent to tell you that. And sometimes before the police arrives, they're gone. But we get their name, duh. So whether they know it or not, they get suspended. Now, um, I don't know about your library, but uh, minors, we do have minors that sometimes are left in the library and the library becomes a, um, uh, the babysitter, childcare center. I'm sure it's in your policy on how old a child could be left alone in the library. But um, that is a major concern also. If uh, there is a minor that's been left in the library and we find out about it, yes, the parents can get suspended for that. And hopefully it doesn't happen to open in your library. Are you keeping up with incident reports? Incident reports, they are very important. If you want to charge somebody, if you want to send somebody home, you always back it up with an incident report. You want to suspend someone, you want to ban someone for, for a day, for a week, for a month, for a whole year, always have an incident report. Because uh, the police would want that, your director would want that, the managers and the directors, and the board of trustees would want that because uh, we want, we love our library. We want to cover our library. We want to make sure that everything we do is up to par, up to policy. So that's what we watch out for. We have other, other issues. We have other major issues. We have medical issues. Um, these are major disruptions, uh, medical issues. Of course, it's not, most of the time it's not their doing but I call it a major incident. Somebody gets a heart attack, just falls on the ground, or somebody bumps their head, you try to do, a, if you're qualified, a lot of libraries go through per se now, um, and CPR and AAD training. If you are not yet in that category, I suggest maybe in the future you go and uh, try to sign up. Fire department gives it out, and uh, AAD per se training. And one lump sum. Uh, it's good to have the background. Um, also, you see, when you see a child get hurt, um, you approach them, of course, ask them what you can do. Um, always ask, do you or do you want us to call for help? Whether you think the child is hurt badly or not, for your incident report, you want to ask, do you want us to call for help? A paramedic. If they decline, of course, their name is going to be there in the report and put down the decline help. Okay. Sometimes the person on the ground, of course, cannot cannot answer you. Just call 911. Like Ali, 911. It is somebody falls on the ground, whether they get up or not. If they set up, call 911 anyway. You don't have to ask their permission, just to be sure they're okay. Call 911. You know, if, 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 you're, if you're in a library that is fortunate enough to have security staff, it's great. If not, it's all right. If you're given the proper tools, such as awareness training occasionally, it will help keep staff up to date on security and safety matters. 
this intro to security cannot and will not be able to stop anyone vent on doing something wrong in the library. But maybe, maybe minimize the effect of damage if you in the library setting is called flat wooded. Please state what will help you as the staff and security crew, but make sure you work within your library policies. Always protect yourself, patron, and the library. And with that, let's open it up for questions. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, I do have several questions that came in, um, you know, with very specific examples and how and how you might address these types of incidents. So um, okay. the first one, the first one, actually, you, you just mentioned about children who are dropped off, um, minor children, or yeah, children who are dropped off for hours at a time without supervision. Um, how how would you handle that situation specifically? I will talk to the parents first, which I've done before. We'll talk to the parents and tell them that we are not a daycare and they cannot do that. And the next time they do it, we will involve the police, which I have done. And um, it's up to us or to the library whether they want to suspend the patron. You have to tell them, you do this again, we will call the police and possibly suspend you from the library for a certain time or a certain amount of time. I've done that and that's how I'll do it. And depending on your policy again in your library, if you can do that. Um, I'll follow up just a question of my own because you know I mentioned to you I, I worked in a public library before coming to Rails and what if you can't get a hold of the parents? Um, what would be your next step? It's funny because um, when we close the libraries, I'm in the library at night and there's somebody that's a minor that he slept in the in grenades below 13 from what I understand or what I can remember. We have to stay open. The peak and security have to stay behind until the parents arrive. Now, if we cannot get a hold of the parents, because most of the time the kids that are left behind do have their, even if they're eight years old, they do have their cell phones. And uh, we can call their parents, but if they don't have their cell phones, we go directly to the police. Now comes the matter of waiting for the parents to pick them up. And that's another incident. It will be an incident. Why did you send? Why did you call the police? Why did you send my kids to the police department? Why did they get picked up? He's only nine, he's only eight, he's only seven. Well, we have a policy. We have that ready. We'll show it to them. And the police will have a copy of that policy and they will take care of it. We'll tell, we'll tell them where the child is and be a police department. I have done it several times. All right. Um, thank you. And just to follow up on that, do you have a recommendation about what age level is appropriate to be allowed in the library without supervision? Uh, if you ask me, 13. I believe that's how they change it now, uh, 13 years old. Uh, 13 years old is good uh, because of what uh, it's uh, Illinois, I believe you can uh, you can legally babysit at 13 years old, from what I can recall. So 13 years old is a good minimum. Now, to take care of minors in the library, I wouldn't recommend, depending on how many, if they're taking care of their, if they're babysitting and they're taking care of one person only or one child, um, like say uh, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, then they just went there and they're taking care of that one particular child. It should be okay at 13. But if there's a couple or more than one, they should be at least 16 years old. Okay, okay. Uh, next question. Um, what about adults wandering alone in the youth department without children? How do you approach and handle that situation? Um, and especially if, if they seem to be uh, stalking young people. 
Um, I did touch on this simply because I, I, do, I, I thought I already had said too many things about something like that in the nature. You know? But um, the last time it happened to me, or the, yes, last time before I retired, I called the detective. Uh, we have a counterpart in the police department, and they sent someone for two, three days to hang around in the library find out who the person was, what their background was, why they're talking. And the third day, he was interviewed on why he was walking around there. Unfortunately, he said he, he said he loves kids. He likes to watch kids. And he hadn't, he doesn't have any, from what the police, the police cannot give you their background. All they can say is he's, he's okay, he's clean. That's all we can get. From there, from the information they gather from their from the de and their data, um, but another experience of mine was when I couldn't. Uh, well, I handled it differently because, like I said, we have to protect the library also. There's a 33-year-old person that is hanging around teenagers. You can tell he's more than 30 already, and uh, I've been watching him for several weeks because he likes to hang around the teenagers. And one night, I caught him kissing a very young teenager outside before closing. So I remember that day, that night, and um, I got the name of the, the, the girl through her friends. And I talked to her friends, and the friends are saying that, yeah, she's starting to want to go out or started going out with that guy. Yeah, that guy is older. And I talked to my director at the time, and uh, so, you know, we're security. We're not equipped to do detective work. Uh, all we can do is observe and report. And uh, that's the only time I saw him very close to this girl. So what I did is I went to my counterpart at the high school and gave that girl's name, and he took over. He's a police officer, also a resource officer. I'm um, glad to say the guy got 33, I mean, got three years in jail and in, uh, was put on a sexual predator list after, after being charged. So, um, Well, it's just to follow up on that. I know some libraries have policies of, of, you know, that if an adult is in the children's department that they should have a child with them or a reason to be there. But so if I, I guess just I think what the question was asking is, you know, if how would you approach that situation? Maybe it's just the first time you've noticed this person in the department. Um, how, oh, how would you okay. handle that? Actually, we just I believe we just passed it before I uh, before I retired. Well, actually, maybe a couple of years ago. Yes. We just tell we just tell them that uh, they have to be with their children in the youth area. Yeah, since since uh, in the library where I used to work now uh, before a journey, they have segregated the youth area from the teen area. So we have uh, a youth area where only children with parents are allowed. If you're alone, then we tell them you have to leave the area. Yes, we do have a policy on that. All right, next question. Um, uh, you touched a little bit on on patrons who appear to be homeless. Um, how would you approach patrons who try to bathe in the restroom? Up front, we just tell them they can't do it. Because uh, if you don't touch them, and they, they normally do it, they, if you don't touch them, they will leave the restroom really wet and messed up like like something happened in there and um, if if i see one going in i'm sad to say but i did this before and i've done it several times i do follow them and pretend i'm using the washroom if they start washing up i will just tell them they can do it um, and i have to send them up 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 front just up front. Um, of course, not every, you know, not everybody or not everybody you can keep track on, but that's the way I approached it 
just directly. You can do it. You can wash up your face. You cannot take a, a, a tub of water and uh, splash your body with it and have water all over the, the ground, if that's what you meant by taking a shower or a bath in the washroom. Um, most of the time, if they're just washing, brushing their teeth or washing their face, that's fine. All right, um, next question. Um, this library says they have a problem with disruptive kids that they throw out of the library and then they come back the next day. Um, and so it, it sounds like this is an ongoing problem. And, and they said they can't take pictures and the kids will not give their names. So um, how can they identify them for other staff and the police so others can be aware of the problem? Uh, the police can be there you can call the police. Uh, then you don't have to warn the kids or tell them, I'm gonna call the police if you don't give me your names. Because uh, most of the time when the police are there, they have to give their information. So what I do, if they don't do that, is call the pro uh, If I had experience already, the fact that they don't want to give their names, the next time they come in, the police is already ready to respond. They will be there. If they don't give their names out, they will be charged trespassing until they give their information. Uh, we are, we can do it as library personnel you know, as a security to charge someone with trespassing. The only drawback in that is you have to go to, you have to go to court when it comes to court, but it never reaches court. Um, it only happened to me twice when I have to go to court. Uh, so uh, call the police when they come in, don't even bother the children, pretend you're not paying attention to them. Police will arrive, they will see the police and they will try to leave and then just point them out to the police officer and that's it just once when they already said they're not going to give they don't want to give their names yeah, forget about it next time just call the police and then you will have their names all right i just want to follow up another um uh, somebody in the audience shared that at their library they have copies of the school yearbook and that helps them identify students. And they do have a policy at their library that they can ask students for school IDs. Um, so I, I just wanted to share that. So thank yeah, you for sharing that. All right, next question. Um, at another library, they have an issue where people are sitting in the parking lot in the cars um, using the library's Wi-Fi. Do you know, is that legal? It happens a lot in all the libraries, as I know, that I've had acquaintance with. Here, uh, where I'm at, it happens. You see them outside. Now, it depends on the library. If you have a policy saying that you can only use the Wi-Fi within the library building, building, I say building, then, you know, if they're outside, you can tell them you can do that outside. Because, uh, if, remember, uh, the, the library, the building is not the only property. You're still in library property when you're in a parking lot. So technically, you shouldn't worry about people who's using your, your uh, Wi-Fi because they're still in library grounds. You understand what I'm saying? You, I hope they get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, Another uh, participant said that they turn their Wi-Fi off 30 minutes after the library closes. So that's, um, although I don't know if the person who asked that question, I don't know if the pol if that problem was happening during the day or overnight. But uh, good well, if it's closed already, if it's off already, they shouldn't be able to access it. Right. Um. Okay. Um, next question: Do you have any recommendations for? resources on developing security policies for libraries? I hope, uh, remember I said earlier, I did I did write a, uh, a library response guide uh, for, uh, for the library. And um, if they are interested, 
I will send this to to whoever wants a copy, and um, they can pattern their uh, either their guide if it's not a policy, or they can pattern their policy from what I've written. It's it's uh, it, it's very comprehensive. Um, it's only 24 pages, but uh, it covers a lot from opening the library to medical. And um, I can ask, if they want to, I can assist them in doing that. It's I'm Ben. I'm seeing several messages from people um, that they would be interested in that. What would be the best way? Would you like them to contact you directly, or is this something that um, I can share with the audience? What would you prefer? Um, you know, actually, it might be better if I give you a copy okay. of my response guide mm -hmm. for the library that I've been, okay. and then they can request a copy from you. I will, you know, I will waive my rights on, uh, well, it's not, it's not really, you know, it's just something I wrote so, uh, so that they can use it and pattern it or, or, you know, use it as a background on what policies they want to come up with. Okay. That would probably be the best one. That way you can also keep track on uh, who have requested it. It would be nice to know who requested what I wrote. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll we'll figure something out. Um, we'll we'll discuss okay. that a little further. Um, you know, I have people who registered for today's program. I have everybody's email, but um, we'll figure out how to share that the best way. Okay. Thank you. Um, then I have a question about recommendations uh, or more information about active shooters. But I, if I remember right, you'll be talking about that next week, right? Okay, just a reminder though, what we're talking about, what we're going to touch on next week, is just something that, uh, you know, it, I, can, I can tell them what to do, what not to do, what to expect. But it's always recommended, I highly recommend that they do an active shooter drill. Or uh, let's just put it this way, an active incident drill where people have to be evacuated. You have to have a sense of feeling of what it's like to hide, to be under the table, to look for a place to run. Because when you have that feeling, then you can have a sense of how to react if it really does happen. I mean, uh, it, it, it's putting yourself in the shoes of somebody who has already been through that. Um, in a minor way. I do suggest they do an active drill, aside from what I'm going to go through next week. It's, it's going to take an hour at the most for an active drill. It shouldn't, it shouldn't bother too much of uh, a library's work time. It can be in one of their regular uh, monthly meeting time. You know, they have an, we have an hour mostly where I came from uh, before work. And uh, they can also integrate it to, uh, to a staff day. Um, and also, like, well, like what I'm doing, I'm doing one next week, not next week, this Friday in one library. Uh, and um, I'm doing an in-person and um, because the director had got through one of my active drill and then she wanted the other staff members to feel what she felt. That is my recommendation, an active drill, aside from what we're going to go through next week. Okay. Yeah, and I know um, uh, one of our participants made the suggestion of contacting your local police department about that as well and, um, you know, to, to arrange a drill or talk to them about you know, yes. it's, it's a good idea to be, to have a good relationship with your local law enforcement enforcement, you know, I mean, in case, God forbid, something like this happens. Um, so, you know, check with your local yeah, that, that's another that's another way of doing it. But remember, when you go to the police department, um, they will have to do it their time. 
simply because they are too busy. And uh, you can also do it in conjunction with the police department if they would allow it. Uh, okay. um, you can try the police department if you want. But uh, I can tell you right now, there are three departments who will not do it. Um, either because of manpower or they just don't, don't want uh, sure. to do it. Okay, I think I just have a couple more questions. Um, this goes back, Ben, this is just uh, in your little biography that we put up with the description. It mentioned that, that you were a vetted member of, is it InfraWard? Uh, a no, partnership actually, between the actually, actually, it's InfraGuard. They can Google it. It's uh, InfraGuard, I-N-F-R-A-G-A-R-D. I, uh, I became a member solely to be able to get information from the FBI, especially for the IT people, because they do give out information sometimes ahead of everyone to members about, you know, um, about viruses, about anything that would uh, harm the infrastructure. Uh, and uh, it is a FBI, uh, public, private, uh, I would say, association. Uh, you have to be vetted, you have to be, uh, you know, you have to pass their, uh, of course, their background check, and they're very, the FBI will do it if you want to be a member. I would suggest put either your head of security or your head of IT to join. It is very, very good, good association to belong to. It is called InfraGuard. InfraGuard, okay. As long as, so I... as long as you don't, oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 I just, I had put a typo in the description, so I will go and fix that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's all the questions I have, Ben. Um, we've got about five more minutes. Is there anything else you'd like to add to wrap up today's session? No, if there's anything that uh, I want to add up, I will add it up. Uh, I will check my my notes and see if I have missed anything and uh, I will bring it up next week. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for your time today and, and sharing a lot of great information. Um, as as um, most of you know, this is a two-part webinar, so next week we will meet again at the same time on Wednesday, September 20th at 1.30. And um, thank you again, Ben, and thank you all for being here. I I did record today's session and you know we'll be posting that on the Rails website shortly. So so Luis, can you um, can you stay uh, so I can talk to you for a little bit? Um actually can I call you in a few minutes? Yes, then? yes, yes. Okay. I'll, I'll call you. All okay, right. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Everyone. Thank you for listening. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.